All right, guys, today we're talking everything FAF 145. So if you're looking for a heavy duty walking foot sewing machine, or maybe you're new to industrials, this will be a great introduction to the topic. They're the type of machine you want for sewing leather or heavy duty projects. While we're at it, we'll compare a couple of similar brands and even a relative to the 145, the FAF 545. Stick around, we'll check it out. Okay, well let's get into setting up and using your FAF 145. It really is a good heavy duty walking foot machine and it happens to be a triple feed machine. So always hold your threads back when you start sewing and let's look at what makes this machine a triple feed. So with a standard domestic sewing machine you just have the feed dog operating from underneath. The feed dog is really the only thing that advances material with a domestic machine. Now, if you add a walking foot mechanism, now you have two feeding mechanisms working together. You have the alternating presser feet up top. That's working together with the feed dog below to pull the material and advance it very evenly. So you don't get differences between your top and bottom later when you finish a row of stitches. Now, just because you have an industrial sewing machine does not mean it's a walking foot. Those terms are separate and different. There are plenty of industrial drop feed machines that are not walking foot. So you have to be careful if you're searching for your first machine. If you need a walking foot because you plan to do heavy vinyl or leather projects or thick material, you really do want that walking foot. But beyond that, one thing to look for is, is your machine a triple feed? And the way you can tell is is the needle down when the material is being advanced. Okay, like this FAF 145, the needle is down and then the material is being advanced. So if you look at the slow cycle of your sewing machine and you can see that the needle is down when the material is being advanced, then indeed you do have a triple feed machine. And that is generally considered superior, although there are good double feed machines that can get the job done. Um, this is generally considered a notch better if you have a triple feed. So with a lot of industrial machines, you can bury the needle and pivot around a corner and lift up that presser foot with your knee lift. That's a nice way to do it. You can also do it with the hand lift in the back, the more traditional way. But once you get used to using the knee lift, it's great because it leaves both hands free. Another thing you'll notice about a walking foot in general is that there's very little you do as an operator to advance the material. Actually, you're just steering it. So if you can just steer along your line, you'll do pretty well. You don't have to do much to pull or push the material through. Now what I hear now is a little bit of belt slipping actually. And so I just put a new servo on this. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and tighten up the tension on the motor belt. And let's take a quick look at that. Now, if you do notice any slipping of the drive belt, here we've installed a servo motor and I'm noticing just a little bit of slipping from the belt and so we'll want to tighten that. So just loosen this jam nut and lower the whole motor assembly by a few thread turns, retighten the jam nut and you'll be all set. You don't have to go too far, just enough to stop the slipping. So with the belt properly adjusted, you'll still be able to deflect it pretty far under light pressure. That's about right there. That'll prevent any slipping. And by the way, when we put a new servo motor on this and a small motor pulley, we used a 38 inch belt. So here's a look at the small motor pulley that we swapped out as we installed our servo motor. That's about the smallest pulley you can get. The net effect is it slows down the machine and gives you a little more punching power. So the machine we're sewing on is a 145 H4 and we'll get to the difference between H3 and H4 in just a minute but first I want to talk about the letters that usually appear below the model number on this brass placard and ours says CLMNP. Your machine may have some of these letters, it may have all of these letters, you may even have all of these letters but in a different order 
and that just relates to the year that your machine was manufactured. But which letters appear here are very important and they more specifically describe the machine. C stands for a class C machine, meaning appropriate for medium to heavyweight components. L means it's a machine appropriate for sewing leather. M means your model has a safety clutch. N refers to the maximum stitch length, which in this case is six millimeters. And P is the last designation, and that just means that it has four motion drop feed. So back to the H3 versus H4 debate. This is an H4 model, and it means it's a high lift. So whether you activate the presser foot lift manually with the hand lift or from the knee lift separately, you'll see that you get quite a high lift. There's a good amount of space under the presser foot, and that's great for going over bulky seams or sewing thick leather or thick material. Where this really helps me having the H4 model is when I'm trying to sew straps into backrest cushions. That's something I would use for Morris chairs and old-fashioned rocking chair upholstery. And you can have up to eight layers of leather. Now your leather might only be two and a half or three ounces thick, but when you get eight layers of it, that's a pretty good workload for any industrial sewing machine. So having that high lift gives you the ability to kind of walk over seams with less trouble. Because it is a high lift, that will affect the needle it uses. All right, well, let's get some things straight about needles that you'll be using with the FAF. What we're sewing on today is the H4 version of the 145, and so that actually takes a 190 system needle. So your needles will say 190 on them, they will also have a size. This one is a size 19. That's a pretty good start. Although I will say I usually use a size 20 indicated down here. If you have a size 20, that's a great needle for using 92 weight thread, which is also commonly called Tex 90. 90 weight thread is really good for upholstery jobs or leather, things like that. So it's a common thread. 92 weight thread and a number 20 needle is a good place to start. But you'll be using a 190 system needle. It's just fundamentally a different system than the one used on the H3 FAF. H3 uses a 134-35 needle and it's just a different needle system. It's a smaller needle. Again, the H3 doesn't have high lift and so it doesn't need as long of a needle. In the foreground, if you can see it, is the 134-35 needle. It's much shorter. In the background is the 190 system needle. I didn't measure it, but it's a good quarter inch longer. So most common mistake I see is somebody will go get an H4 FAF and they'll put in a, a different needle that's a little bit too short. And guess what? Functionally, your timing will be off. Even though it's not because you put the wrong needle in, it won't sew. What if we compare the FAF needles to the more common Conso and Juki needles? This is a 135-17 needle system, commonly used on Conso 226s, 206s, uh, Juki 562, 563, that sort of machine. It's a 135-17. That's the needle system. Now, this needle is very similar in size to the FAF 134-35 needle. And so if we compare those two, you can see they're almost the same length. So we'll bring them side by side. And we see that the 134-35 needle is just ever so slightly shorter than a 135-17. Most upholstery pros will just use those two needles interchangeably. But hey, if you have to buy a bunch of needles and you're running uh, 145 H3, you might as well just get the, the correct needles that were specified by the manufacturer, and that would be the 134-35 needle. If you're running a Conso or a Juki, your manual will likely tell you that it's a 135-17 needle that you're looking for. The one thing that might throw you is on this needle system, if it's a leather point, it'll actually be called a 135-16. 
It's the same needle system. The 16 just denotes that it's a leather point. Among the FAF needles, the way to tell if it's a leather point is this LR. So this is a 190 needle and it says LR after. That means it's a leather needle. By contrast, here is a 190 needle where it says R and that's a round point needle appropriate for cloth or vinyl. If you're actually sewing in leather, you'll need that LR for leather point. All right, let's touch on bobbins real quick. The 145, FAF 145 will use a G-style bobbin, okay? Here's a metal G-style bobbin. Here's a pre-wound G-style bobbin. And these are considered a standard industrial bobbin. And other machines that will take this type of bobbin are a Juki LU562 or a Conso 226. So some similarities there. These two bobbins here are M-style bobbins. This one has holes around the perimeter. It's a metal bobbin in an M-style. This one is also an M-style, but it just has a single slot. You see these type of bobbins a lot on the FAF, just with a single slot. Now, a FAF that takes a M-style bobbin would be a 545 or a 1245. So those are other machines that would take an M-style bobbin on the Conso side. A Conso 206 RB, any of the versions one through five would take the M-style bobbin. So this is considered a large style bobbin, the M. And if this is the great white, then the Megalodon is here, the U-style bobbin. And you'd find this on some Juki machines, including one that I sew with, the LU-563. It's got, um, it's called a double size bobbin. And they call it that because it's purportedly holds twice the amount of thread as a standard G-style bobbin. There's also a little different looking bobbin. This is a, an A-style bobbin that you'll find on the Sailrite Ultrafeed machines. I use this A-style on my Sailrite leather work. So these are just some of the common industrial bobbins that you'll run into if you sew on enough machines. The M-style, the G-style, the A, and the big U-style. So the FAF uses a top loading or drop-in style bobbin and if you're coming from the Conso or the Juki world, these little half style bobbin cases will seem pretty odd to you, but there's kind of a method to the madness. They make sense. For instance, if you're sewing on a Conso 226 or a, a Juki LU562 or LU563, they are also top loading drop-in bobbins but to adjust the tension on the bobbin case for those machines, you would actually have to use a small screwdriver, take out either two or three screws, depending on the model, and just to access that, that tension adjustment. And so with the FAF, what they've done is they've made it, instead of a full bobbin case, they've made it kind of a half-shaped bobbin case, and that allows you to pop off the part you need to make the adjustment and leave everything else in place. And the system does work pretty good once you're used to it. So you just flip that little half bobbin case over. And when you grab your bobbin, the thread should be unspooling this way. As I pull it from left to right, my bobbin is unspooling. So that's the direction the thread is coming off. And you can see there's a little angled slot in the bobbin case is going back this way. So it's an anti-backlash mechanism. Almost all bobbins go in that way, but you go against the rotation of the bobbin and make sure that you're under this little tab. That's what provides the tension from the bobbin case. Okay, once you're under the tab, all you have to do is come in this little notch in the bobbin case. Once the thread is in that notch, then you're ready to drop the bobbin case into the machine. I'm around the back of the machine now because it's really the only hope I have to show you how this bobbin case goes in, but the key thing is you want to make sure that the thread is in this little half notch in the bobbin case. Okay, so if your thread is in the half notch there, go ahead and drop the bobbin case down into the machine and it sits right over a post. Okay, once you're sitting over that post, you can flip the little tab down and what you'll notice is the two little half notches now form a hole and if you're getting light but even tension, 
as you pull the thread from the bobbin case area, then you're all situated and you're ready to draw up your lower thread and start sewing. All right, let's thread up the machine. When you're working with any industrial sewing machine, you wanna use industrial sewing spools. I often have a thread sock in place and that's just to prevent the thread from looping and catching down somewhere underneath the thread stand. So with a home machine, the spool will actually rotate because it's so small and has such light weight. For industrials, they don't. They come off the top and the spool is stationary. So you want to go through the hook on your thread stand. From the thread stand, we'll head down to the first guide post on the machine. You can hit it twice or just once. It's not really critical. If you do hit it twice, make the second one that you hit head down towards the upper tension assembly. Once you've gone through the upper guide post, you can go through either one or two holes here, depending on your model. This is an original upper thread tension for this FAF 145. It only has one hole. So you go through the one hole and then over this guide post until it clicks. You wanna make sure that your presser foot is lifted for this next step because you need to have the tension discs loosened or it's best to have the tension discs loosened as you feed the thread between the two tension discs. Okay, now here's where a lot of people go wrong on the fafs. I'm gonna tell you real quickly what not to do. Don't continue up and go around this post. Okay, somewhere Uncle Larry told somebody that that's how you thread a faf and everyone has continued to espouse that sort of information. It's just not true. FAF never recommended going around that post. I don't recommend going around that post. So through the guide hole, around the guide post, with your presser foot lifted, lift it up, go through the tension discs and continue on to the thread controller, okay? Now when you're between the discs of the thread controller here, you wanna hold back your thread somewhere up here and lift this up. You'll start to see it move the check spring continue pulling it up until it clicks into place. Okay, so it fell back down into this little notch. And that way the controller spring, the check spring will be able to act on the thread as you're sewing, okay? So from there, you can take out a little bit of your slack. Everything's threaded correctly through the tension mechanism. And we're gonna go upwards through a guide to the take up arm. Take up arm from right to left. We're gonna head back down through the same guide that we went up through, through another thread guide here. And then you wanna go down through the needle bar thread guide, which on most models allow you to slide in from the left to right. If you don't have that slot where you can slide the thread in, it might just be a captive hole and you can just poke the thread through from the top. From there, just go ahead and thread the needle from left to right. Hold the upper thread back loosely as you rotate the hand wheel towards you, and we'll pick up that lower bobbin thread. Run an object like a pair of scissors or something that's not your finger, preferably, underneath to pick up the thread. Close your slide plate, and you're ready to sew. Remember to hold both the upper and lower threads back as you start to sew. And it's always a good idea to back tack a few stitches. If you start your back tack with the needle in the fully down position, plus rolling the hand wheel towards you up a little bit, you have the best chance of getting nice even stitches in both forward and reverse. Sometimes that matters when your stitches in forward and reverse line up, like leather working and straps where the stitching is exposed. But most of the times with just common applications like upholstery where you're doing a blind seam, it doesn't matter too much. And these German made FAF machines, I've also noticed it with the Japanese made Konsos and Jukis. They just have a wonderful mechanical sound to them. They, they don't make much noise. They're very smooth in operation and they're just really a joy to sew on. Um, of course, with any sewing machine, if you bury the needle to pivot around a corner, you'll get a nice square corner and you won't lose that corner stitch. So that's always a good way to go. You can 
adjust your stitch length as needed. We'll drop that down and show a little bit longer stitch length on the 145. So you can do anything from a pretty tight stitch that you would use for heavyweight upholstery fabrics up to kind of a longer baseball stitch for decorative seams and top stitching. Back tack at the end of your seam to lock in the stitch and away you go. Now if you raise the presser foot your threads should release easily from the machine. If they don't release easily either your machine's not releasing tension or you just have the upper tension set way too tight. The goal is always just to balance the tension so that you're not showing loose loops or knots on the bottom but ultimately you want to use as little tension as possible to balance that stitch. Now to adjust the presser foot tension on the FAFs you can do one of two things. You can loosen this threaded knob for less pressure on the foot and there's also a threaded insert below that that takes a large flat screwdriver you can loosen that for slightly less pressure. Truth be told with the FAFs of this particular tension assembly where it's internal I've never felt like it controls the tension very well. These FAFs always run with very stiff pressure and short of cutting the internal spring there's very little that you can do to change that. There are other models of 145 and 545, both in the H3 and H4 variants, that have an external leaf spring here too. Um, they're not quite as refined looking, but that mechanism was actually very easy to adjust the tension on the presser foot. Consos and Jukis have an internal leaf spring. Those are easy in that regard as well. So just something to note about this style of FAF 145. Activate reverse stitching by lifting the lever all the way up. If you want to shorten the stitch length, just twist this knob clockwise and you'll shorten up the stitch length both in forward and reverse. There's a wing nut adjustment on the back of your machine common to most any walking foot. If you loosen that wing nut, you can raise or lower this in a slot. And if you want to start with thin materials and you don't need very much steppage, you can leave that down in the lower part of the slot and tighten the wing nut. For most of us, unless you want this all the way up and to have it look like a dog wearing socks, for most of us, we'll put it about three quarters of the way up and retighten that wing nut. As far as the three most commonly neglected lubrication points on the FAF, I'd have to say one is behind your machine, there's a little cover plate that you can lift. Put a dot or two of oil on this mechanism here. Number two, I would say, is the lubrication spot at the top of the machine, just under the cover plate. There's several under here, actually, but most of them are well marked with red. The one that I see people miss is this journal right by the hand wheel. Number three, remember to open your slide plate far enough to expose this lubrication point. Otherwise, look for free online manuals to identify all the rest of the lubrication points, some of which are marked and some aren't. When you tip back the head on a 145, you might think initially that something's missing. And really, I think that's the beauty in the FAF is just its simplicity. It's gear driven and it has these grease covers on both the left and right end, safety clutch, and one difference between the FAF and other makes like Conso and Juki is the component that accepts the knee lift is run by a roller rather than just a sliding friction point with the Consos and Jukis so that's one difference and I think it's probably a little better mechanism on the FAF but overall just fewer moving parts and the FAF seem to be very well built. Winding a bobbin on the FAF is no different than any industrial sewing machine with an external bobbin winder Although in this example, we're stacking threads off to the right side of the bobbin. And if that's the case for you, what you want to do is loosen this adjustment screw on the bobbin winder and slide the mechanism over. Retighten the screw, retest that, and adjust as necessary until you're getting nice even winding on the bobbin. Of course, when you do thread for winding the bobbin, come through the hole around the back of the tension discs 
and then through the bobbin from inside to out. Activate the bobbin winding by pushing that lever back. It should kick back on its own when the bobbin winding is done. If you need to adjust how much thread is being left on the bobbin, clockwise will bend the finger back and allow more thread to be loaded onto the bobbin. Counterclockwise on this screw will do the opposite. If you're getting loose, unsightly loops on the bottom of your material, the first thing to try is to increase your upper tension by turning this knob clockwise. Do that several times in terms of half turns and recheck with test samples. And you ought to be able to solve that problem of loose loops on the bottom by just increasing upper tension. If it gets to the point where you can't solve the problem by increasing upper tension, you just may have to decrease the bobbin tension. Let's look at how to do that. So we'll open up our slide plate and just catch with a thumbnail the tab to release the bobbin case. And again with the faff, these are just kind of half bobbin cases. So if we pull our thread out of the way so we can see what we're doing, here's the half bobbin case. And there's two little screws on the side of it. This one at the end just holds the tension thread assembly, this tab, in place. So that's not the adjustment screw. The adjustment screw usually has a little lip around it. And when you adjust that, think about it in terms of quarter turn adjustments, clockwise for more bobbin tension, counterclockwise for less. With our example here, we were gonna do less bobbin tension, so let's come back to where we were, and then let's decrease it another quarter turn, and then we would reinstall things and retest the situation there to see if by backing off the bobbin tension, we could then in turn back off the upper tension and get a nice low tension sewing situation with evenly balanced stitches. Raise the needle bar up to top dead center and then rolling the hand wheel forward towards you slightly. That's a nice release point. Lift the knee lift and your material should release easily. And that's got it. Nice even balanced stitch and overall a good low tension situation. All right guys, there it is. All things FAF 145. My hope is that you learned one or two little tidbits by watching this short introduction. Maybe you can get out there and get your hands on a machine, or at least look up the stats and specs to see which one might be best for your application. Hey, thanks for watching. We'll catch you on the next one.